Okay, good morning everybody and um, good morning. Welcome to uh, the next edition of Gemara Sanhedrin. I want to um, dedicate this shiur to, uh, for a refuah shleima, to a very important person to us, um, Rav Aidin Steinsaltz, on whom we rely very strongly, um, is very poorly in hospital with pneumonia. Um, and uh, we pray for his speedy recovery. Um, Harav Aidin Ben Rifka Leah uh, should be added to your prayers for a Rafua Shalema. Uh, hopefully, all the incredible merits that he must have uh, for enabling people like us to, uh, to delve into the depths of the Torah, thanks to his. Uh, life's work, hopefully all those uh, merits will bring about a Rafua Shalema for him. Um, so we wish him uh, a speedy recovery and we hope that this learning that we're going to do, uh, which is going to be based on his uh, explanations of this Gemara, will uh, add to those merits for him to have a Rafua Shalema. Okay, last week... Um, we, uh, last week, we ended up talking about the possibility that our discussion earlier between Shmuel and Rabbi Abahu about how many people, how many judges were required um, for a monetary case You'll remember those were the first three words of our Gemara. We haven't progressed very far in uh, eight, nine months because we're still on the first three words. But you need to record. Oh, okay. What did you say, Michael? You just press the button. You need to record. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm recording. I think, aren't I? Yes, I am. Yeah, you are. You are now. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Can I ask you a question? Yes, you can. Yeah. Do we? Oh, this is just for um, information only. But do we actually, within the next week or two, come to a conclusion about how many judges are needed, or is it going to continue for ad infinitum? Not ad infinitum, but um, a little while yet. Right. Okay. Because, because we're, we're going to go off a bit of a tangent shortly. Okay. It was just that I was wondering if yeah, sure. at any point. We could have a summary oh. of what we've actually. I'll find you back learned. later. <laughs> okay, um, let me mute you all. Okay, let me answer your question now, uh, Julia. Once we get to the end of this, uh, and we do come to some sort of uh, halachic conclusion, um, we can uh, work out a summary table uh, of who says what and why. Okay, but it, uh, but you've got to hang on a bit yet. I mean, you know, it's uh, we're only been doing this nine months, so uh, uh, you know, if you'd have been doing Daf Hayomi, you'd have finished this Masechta by now, uh, but you wouldn't actually know anything because it's far too fast. Um, okay, so last week we spoke about the idea that the discussion between Shmuel and Rabbi Abahu was also a discussion of Tanaim in an earlier generation. And we uh, spoke about Rabbi Meir and uh, the Chachamim. And if you recall, we spoke about Rabbi Meir's opinion of compromise. Um, and Brian has just joined us, and I know that, uh, not Brian, sorry, Mervyn it was that spoke to me uh, and told me that he was really uh, quite, uh, amazed at Rabbi, um, Rabbi Meir's opinion of, of compromise. Remember, Rabbi Meir was the one that used the word bitsua. Um, and I showed you a pasuk where the word bitsua uh, meant theft. Uh, Rabbi Meir's opinion is that compromise is not what we should be doing because it ends up pleasing nobody. Uh, and Rabbi Meir was uh, a halachist, halachist and he wanted uh, the judgment to be made according to the halakha, not compromise. And he uses this rather negative term about compromise, bitsua. Whereas the chachamim 
were very much in favour of compromise and they use a much nicer word for compromise, pshara. Um, and so um, we, we spoke about this at the end of last week. And uh, let's go from here. Leimak katanai. Let's say that the dispute between uh, Shmuel and Rabbi Bahu is uh, um, paralleled in a dispute between Tanaim. Rabbi Meir, Bitsua uh, Bishlosha. Compromise is done, has to be done with three judges. Divre Rabbi Meir. This is what Rabbi Meir said. Chachamim Omrim, Pshara Biyachid. A compromise can be done with one judge. That's what we said last week. Now, this is where we're going to do, this is new now. Savaruha, the, uh, the assumption is, Lekule Alma Makshinan Pshara Ladin. You're not sharing it's the not... screen, Johnny. You're oh, not sharing... you're not share the screen. Okay, sorry. Let me yeah, share the screen. Think... Right, let me share the screen. Sorry about that. Thank you for reminding me. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Right, Svaruha, over here where my pointer is. Uh, the assumption is, Lekule Alma, according to everybody, Makshinan Pshara Ladin. Uh, compromise and halachic adjudication are comparable. In other words, they are going along the same track because we are talking here if you remember, Shmuel and Rabbi Abahu's uh, um, discussion was about how many judges were needed to make a verdict. It was nothing to do with compromise. We're now saying that there's a parallel discussion between Rabbi Meir and the Chachamim about compromise. So therefore, the assumption must be that compromise and Halachic adjudication, so din, are comparable. Otherwise, the two statements are, are speaking at cross purposes. That's the assumption from this little section here. Um, by saying, by bringing this dispute between Rabbi Meir and Chachamim as to how many judges are required for compromise, we must be assuming that compromise and halachic adjudication are comparable. Right, so, my love, but how come mythology? Actually, is that really what they're arguing about? Damar Sava, that one holds Din Bishlosha, one holds Rabbi Meir, that you need to do adjudication with three. Umar Sava, and that would be the Chachamim, one master, the Chachamim, din bishnayim, that the other one is, the other one says that you can do a din with two judges. Is that what we're really saying? Now, on the basis of what we've said up here, that we have a comparison between pshara and din, then that is what we're saying. But as you can see, there are question marks here, and there are, these are rhetorical questions. And the Gemara is saying, Really? Is that really the case? That Rabbi Meir says three judges are required for a din? And the Chachamim say that two judges are required for a din? How can we say that? Let's go back to our Mishnah. What does our Mishnah say? Should know this by heart by now. Dine mamonot bishlosha. Three judges are required. So how can the Chachamim say it's two? So. The Gemara says, lo, that's not the case. This little statement here, Svaruha, uh, it's assumed that everybody agrees that we compare Pshara, compromise to Din, says the Gemara now, no, that's not the case. It's not the case. Why? De Kuli Alma, everybody agrees. Din Bishlosha. When we're talking about a halachic adjudication, in brackets, as opposed to compromise, we need three. Everybody agrees that. So what are they disagreeing about? Vahacha, baha, kamifligi. This, the following, is what they're disagreeing about. 
We just said that there was an assumption that everybody agreed that they compare a compromise to din. This little bit of Gemara says that's not the case. Actually, that's what they're arguing about. Demar Sava, one of the opinions holds, Makshinan Pshara Ladin, that we do compare compromise to din. And therefore, that's Rabbi Meir who says we hold, everybody holds we need three for din, and Rabbi Meir holds that we compare compromise to din and therefore we need three for compromise umar savar but the the chachamim hold lo makshinan pshara the din the two things are not comparable we need three for din because everybody agrees that we need three for din but according to the uh chachamim we actually only need one for pshara and the argument is whether we compare din to compromise. That is according to this part of the Gemara. Right, fine. So we kicked out this bit, which said it's assumed that everybody agrees there is a comparison. And now we're saying that this, this disagreement between Rabbi Meir and the Chachamim is based on whether we can say that the process for making a halachic decision is the same as the process which we use for making a compromise. Right. Full stop for the moment. So now the Gemara is giving a little bit of what Julia wanted. It's a little bit of a summary. It's not a full summary, but it's a little bit of a summary. Lema, let's say, it's a suggestion. Talata tanae bipshara. There are three. Remember, taf and shin are interchangeables. Change those tafs to shin and you get shalosh. Okay? Shlosha. Yeah? So, talata, three. Talata, tanae, bipshara. Let's say then, if that's the case, says the Gemara, there are actually three different opinions regarding compromise. Oh my goodness. We've just said there are two. Where's the third one? Right, you just told me there were two. There's Rabbi Meir who says there's three, need three for Pshara, and there's the Chachamim who say you need one. Where are you going to find me a third one from? So here it goes. Demar Savar Bishlosha. Rabbi Meir is the one that holds we need three judges for compromise. Umar Savar Bishnaim. Cast your mind back to the bottom of page 5a, right? I will show it to you. The bottom of page 5a, here we go. It's on page 28 for those of you who are following in your own Gemara, right at the bottom there. Eitve, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, Hadin Bishlosha, Halachic adjudication is done by three, Upshara bishnayim, and compromise is done with two judges. You'd forgotten about that, hadn't you? Yes, so had I. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so let's say there's three. Mar Sava bishlosha, Rebbe Meir says three. Umar Sava and this master, which is Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, he says bishnayim, that there are two judges required for compromise. Umar Savar and the third master, which is the Chachamim, Beyachid, is an individual. Fine, so now that's nice. Yeah, we've got three different opinions uh, to throw in the mix. Ah, but the Gemara says, no, that's not the case. Amar Rav Acha Bered Rav Ika. This man, Rav Acha, the son of Rav Ika, said, Ve'itema, and others say it wasn't him, it was Rabbi Yemar Bash Lamya. Doesn't really matter who they were to us. Somebody said, Man de Amar Tre, the opinion that said we need two judges, which was Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel at the bottom of page 5a, Afilu Chad Nami. He would say, although he said two, he would agree actually that one would do. And the, the um, logic behind that 
is that this is a pshara. It is not a din. If this is a compromise, it is not a halachic decision. Once you are not making a halachic decision, you don't need three judges. And once you don't need three judges, it doesn't matter, says this rabbi, according to Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, whether you've got two or one. It makes no difference. So you're going to ask me, in that case, why did he say two and not one, if it makes no difference? And I will answer you that question as soon as Howard has asked his question. And my question is, is none of this reduced into writing? Because if you're dependent on one, two or three judges uh, com confirming as witnesses that a compromise was arrived at, then you're dependent upon their mortality. Whereas if it's written down and they sign as witnesses, it's a different matter. Number one, who said it's not written down? No, well, I'm asking if it is. Yeah, yeah. Number two... We're going to come in, maybe not today, but we might get to it today, but if it's not today, it'll be next week. We're going to see that even with a compromise, there needs to be a firm uh, agreement between the litigants. And uh, you'll see that actually that is, is uh, exactly your question. It's a very pertinent question. Um, and uh, witnesses are required. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and in fact, in fact, that is the answer to this question. You asked the question at the perfect time, because I just asked the question which the Gemara is going to, which the Gemara implies. We've just said that Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel said that he requires two judges for a compromise, and we've just said that actually, really, one would do. Yeah, man da amatre, the one that said two, Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel, afilu chad, even one. Nami also would do. So why did he say two? Why didn't he say one? Because you can certainly, I mean, it follows. If you say one, it certainly follows that two is okay. But if you say two, it doesn't necessarily follow that one is okay. So the Gemara is asking a good question. Why, if he one would have done, why didn't he say one? You could have learned two from one. You can't necessarily learn one from two. And that is a very typical Gomorrah cop sort of uh, um, questioning. So what's the answer? Brilliant answer. The answer is based on the question that Howard just asked. The answer is this. Sahadei <laughs> means, they say, it's an um, Aramaic word for adim for witnesses. If you have two judges, they can then later on in a court of law, if it ever came to it, they would be able to testify that these two litigants came to a compromise and agreed it. Whereas if there was only one judge, and let's say one of the litigants turned around and said, I never agreed to that, and then he takes him to court over it, you've only got one witness, and one witness, as we know, is no use. So Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel says two witnesses, not because he believes that two witnesses are required for a compromise, sorry, two judges are required for a compromise, but he's thinking ahead, and he's predicting that the, that the one who uh, thinks that he's got a better case than he got out of the compromise, Later on, he's going to have charata. He's going to get, he's going to get charoti, and he's going to regret the compromise. He's going to go to court and say, I never agreed to that compromise. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel suggests, and it's only a suggestion, uh, that we have two judges so that those two judges can come to the court and give uh, oral testimony that they witnessed him agree to the compromise. Okay. So um, it doesn't fully answer your question about it being written down, Howard, but it, it does partially answer um, that we can see that these things are binding. Um, and we're going to see later on in the Gemara that uh, we actually go through a process to make it binding in terms of the compromise. OK, so um, at the moment, then we've now said um, 
we've now said that we have got not three opinions, we've really only got two opinions. You either need three judges for a compromise, and that would be Rebbe Meir, or you need one judge for a compromise, and that would be the Chachamim and Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. But Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel gives you a piece of advice and says, if I were you, I'd have two judges so that uh, at a later date, if required, those two judges would be able to testify that this actually happened and it was not a figment of the imagination of one of the litigants. Fine. Now, the Gomorrah takes a breath and says, okay, what can we learn from all that then? It goes off a little bit of a tangent now, but not complete tangent. It says, what can we learn from this whole machloket, this whole discussion? And Ravashi starts to, the, the ball rolling. And he says, Amar Ravashi, Shma Mina, let's learn from here that this whole, uh, this whole discussion, Shma Mina, Pshara Eina Tzricha Kinyan. Compromise does not require a Kinyan. A Kinyan is a formal act of acquisition. Um, you will no doubt have uh, seen uh, at formal events such as a vault or at a wedding uh, at the time where the Ketubah is signed that there is an act of Kinyan, an act of acquisition. And what you usually find is the rabbi who's conducting the ceremony brings out a hanky or something like that or a kippah and he raises it up, or, or he asks one of the people involved in what they're doing to raise it up. That is an act of acquisition. He says, here, this is my uh, handkerchief, actually, this is my uh, lens cleaner, uh, and I'm giving it to you. You are acquiring this, and by lifting it up, you are making a formal act of acquisition. According to Halakha, there are two ways to make a formal acquisition of something. One when we is sell the chomets, Johnny. Sorry, Johnny? When we sell the chomets, we also have a Correct. Kenyan. Absolutely. Correct. We make a Kenyan when we sell the chomets because it's a, a transaction. So whenever there is a transaction, we make a Kenyan. There are two ways of, of formalizing a transaction, of acquiring something. So when you sell the chomets or when you buy the chomets, you have to do one of these two acts of acquisition. One is hagba'ah, same word as hagba'ah of lifting up the Sefer Torah, it's elevating it. And the other is mashicha, drawing it towards you, drawing it towards you. Um, and uh, one of those two acts is required to make uh, an act of acquisition formalized. Usually today we do this, we raise up and we do this hagba'ah, and that is uh, doing a kinyan. Now, just as uh, an aside, um, some of you um, may be uh, familiar with uh, the work of Rabbi Natan Slifkin, uh, known as the Zoo Rabbi, known as uh, the Rationalist Judaism Rabbi. A um, little bit of uh, background. Uh, Natan Slifkin, when he... A heretic. Uh, sorry? A heretic. According to some, he is a heretic. <laughs> uh, according to others like me, he is a hero. Uh, uh, Natan Slifkin, when he was a little boy in Manchester, was known as Nossen Slifkin. Um, and he lived on Neville Road, for those of you who know Manchester, uh, just off Moor Lane. His father, Dr. Michael Slifkin, was a genius... Uh, physicist or mathematician, um, he uh, had uh, Nossen Slifkin at the age of nine um, had uh, a very, very important uh, um, part of his life, and that was the fact that my wife was his babysitter uh, and used to take him for walks on the uh, moors over Moor Lane collecting insects 
uh, and he had in his bedroom all sorts of mad animals. And he then, of course, became a zoo rabbi in later years with degrees in zoology. He now is the uh, director and owner of the Nash Na Natural History Museum, B Biblical Museum in uh, Bet Shemesh, uh, which if you've never been to, you must go to see. Uh, and those of you who are fortunate to have children or grandchildren uh, must take them with you. Uh, uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Anyway, that's uh, Nossam Slifkin as he was. In 2004, um, um, he wrote several books. Well, he wrote several books. In 2004, a book was published which um, spoke about all the places in the Gemara where the science was incorrect. In other words, the, his, his, his uh, approach based on the Rambam was that the science uh, spoken about in the Gemara was the science of the day and not necessarily correct. And um, he was uh, castigated. That's not a strong enough word. He was excommunicated. He was put in Khairam by the Haredi world. His kids were kicked out of school, spat at. Uh, um, um, things were put on, notices were put on the wall to say that he was a heretic, nobody should speak to him, he wasn't allowed to have an aliyah, in sure he was kicked out of everywhere. He was a proper, proper cheyrem put on him by the Haredi world, uh, because he said these things about Chazal. Um, if you're interested to read the whole story, go onto Wikipedia and look up the Slifkin affair, S-L-I-F-K-I-N, the Slifkin affair. Um, Anyway, why am I telling you all this? Because one of the things that he pointed out that the Gemara, uh, the Chachamim of the Gemara were uh, mistaken in their understanding of science was about Meshicha and Hagba'ah, the way you acquire the Gemara uh, in, in somewhere where I, I can't remember exactly where it is, um, um, talks about uh, the question of how do you acquire an elephant? If you buy an elephant off an elephant salesman, how do you acquire it? Because you have to either draw it towards you or lift it up in the same way as we have to do Meshicha or Hagba'a for anything. Now, if you have a goat, you buy a goat, you put a rope round its neck and you schlep it towards you and you, you've done Meshicha and that's your act of acquisition. So the Gemara asks, a theoretical question, how do you acquire an elephant? And one opinion is that you dangle some food in front of it and it will come towards you and that counts as Mashiach because you have effectively drawn it towards you and that's fine. And another opinion in the Gemara says, yes, that's a good idea. And also you could dangle some food above it and it would jump up and uh, get the food that you're dangling up in front of it, um, and therefore you will have effectively done hagba'a. And everyone says, well, that's a great idea. That's how you acquire an elephant. That's how you do the act of acquisition. And um, Natan Slifkin, in his book, pointed out that elephants cannot jump, okay? They are not able to jump. They are too heavy, and the structure of an elephant, the musculoskeletal structure of an elephant does not allow it to jump. And that was one of the examples that he gave um, to um, make his point that we should not be relying on the science of Chazal, that the science of Chazal was based on the knowledge at that time and nothing more. Um, and for that, um, he is still suffering to this day. Um, and uh, I would recommend to you, uh, looking up the Slifkin Affair, I would recommend to you all of his books. And most of all, I would recommend that you subscribe to his blog called uh, Rationalist Judaism, um, where you will um, see many, many well thought out, well researched uh, opinions uh, about all sorts of interesting things based on a rationalist approach to Judaism based almost exclusively, but not, but not entirely exclusively, on the uh, teachings of Rambam, Maimonides. Okay. Excuse me, Johnny, Johnny didn't people apologise to him in the end? 
uh, not, people. Many, not many. Oh. <laughs> uh, one or two did. One or two did, but the vast majority still consider him to be uh, a, a heretic of the first order. Rav Mizrahi, I hate to call him Rav Mizrahi. I will just yeah. call him Mizrahi. Um, yeah. uh, said that he should put him on the list of people who ought to be burnt. Um, uh, together with Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and Rabbi Ephraim Mervis. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that I am not on that list yet. Yeah. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't yet been heretical enough to get on Mizrahi's list. I'm working on it, though. Um, so, I, I uh, said, Johnny, we could arrange for it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, please do. I, I would wear it as a badge of honour, David. <laughs> Absolutely. And yes, yeah, Johnny, you, Johnny, you do have one of the qualifications. You come from Manchester. As did Rabbi Dr. Louis Jacobs, who, whose teachings, if I may use that word, sound very similar to Slifkin's. Uh, I'm no. surprised that Spinoza didn't come from Manchester. Uh, I, I, Spinoza probably had Manchester relatives. Uh, let's, just, <laughs> let's just clear up one thing, though, Howard. just want to clear up one thing. There is one very, very fundamental difference between Rabbi Dr. Louis Jacobs' uh, writings and those of uh, all the other heretics that uh, uh, Mizrahi uh, has listed. And that is this. Rabbi Louis Jacobs in 1956 wrote his pamphlet, um, We Have Reason to Believe, um, and basically questioned the entire concept of Torah min Hashemayim. That Torah was given from uh, God's uh, mouth to Moshe at Sinai. And in so doing, he crossed the uh, very red line between orthodoxy and non-orthodoxy. All of the other rabbis, including Rabbi Natan Slifkin, uh, do not believe uh, that. All of them believe in Torah min Hashemayim. However, what they do believe is that the human beings uh, in the Torah, and certainly the human beings in the Mishnah and the Gemara, were human beings, were subject to human failings, and were subject to uh, the limitations of human knowledge at that time. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu did not know about electricity uh, or COVID-19 or the internet or any other of the modern things that we all know about. That does not make him any less of a, uh, of a great human being. It just makes him a human being. There's a massive difference between Rabbi Dr. Louis Jacobs' um, theology and the theology uh, of the others. Uh, what, what is similar is that they uh, both held their views very firmly, stuck to their views, and were not, uh, didn't allow themselves to be bullied out of their own views. Uh, whether you agree with uh, the views or not, and I don't agree with the views of Dr. Louis Jacobs, Rabbi Dr. Ju Louis Jacobs, on that particular point, and I do agree with the views of uh, Rabbi Natan Slifkin and others, uh, but it, whether you agree with him or not, uh, the similarity is the fact that they stuck to their guns um, and paid the price. Both of them paid the price, uh, and, and a very steep price too. So why am I telling you all that? Just because it's interesting. Um, and we were talking about a Kinyan. Okay. Um, if the Gemara is allowed to go off at a tangent, then so am I. So, what's all this got to do with us? Shma mina pshara eina tzricha kinyan. Says our Gemara, we can learn from here that compromise does not require formal acquisition by a kinyan. Why? Why? How can we learn that? Gemara is going to explain to us now how we can learn that. De'i sal kedaitach tzricha kinyan. This expression here, de'i sal kedaitach, that is a very common expression which I'd like you to try and remember. It literally means if it will come into your mind. In other words, if you will suggest. How does Stein's out translate it? If it enters your mind that. Okay, that's a good translation. If it enters your mind, if you're going to suggest that uh, shara compromise does require kinyan, does require a formal ac acquisition, Leman de Ama Tricha Tlata Lamale. The one that says it does need uh, a formal acquisition 
Why does he need three judges? In other words, Rabbi Meir. If Rabbi Meir holds that pshara, compromise, requires a formal act of acquisition, then why does he require three judges? That formal acquisition is, makes it binding. In the same way, as if I give you a gift and you do a Kenyan on that gift, that's binding. I can't have it back then. No judges are required at all for that. I don't need a judge. I don't need anything. I might need two witnesses if, if I come along, or you might need two witnesses if I come along and deny it later on. But assuming we're not any, any hanky-panky like that, we don't need any judges. So why would, um, why, excuse me, while I just get rid of that call. Oh, everyone's phone, sorry. There we go. Um, why would we need any, any judges? Why would we need three judges to formalize this whole process? Of course, that's what Rabbi Meir is saying. He's saying, remember, Shara is comparable to Din. Din needs three judges, therefore compromise needs three judges. The question of the Gemara is a very clever question. If you require a Kinyan for a compromise, what do you need three judges for? You've already got a formal process. Okay, so tiske betray. Let it be enough to have two judges. Why do you need two judges? For the reason that Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel suggested, wasn't a, 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 a halacha, but suggested two, so that if needed, you have two judges for two people for witnessing, uh, to witness the, the Kinyan uh, like we do when we have a ketubah. When you have, uh, has anybody ever, hands up, have you ever been a witness on a ketubah? Have you ever been an aide on a ketubah? Okay, yeah, few of you have been an aide. So what did you have to do? You had to understand what was in the ketubah. You had to ensure that the chatan understood what he was uh, getting himself into. And you had to witness the chatan make a kinyan. And only after you had done that, did you sign your name on the ketubah. And what you were signing as a witness was you were signing to witness, not the ketubah itself. You were witnessing that the chatan understood the terms of that ketubah that he had made a kinyan on. Okay, that is what you were signing about. So here the Gemara says, why do we need three judges? Rabbi Meir shouldn't need three judges. You're making a kinyan, that's a formal acquisition, that's binding. Two judges would be enough, and they don't even need to be judges, they just need to be kosher witnesses. Velikne mine, and let him acquire it. In other words, let the thing be binding through the kinyan. Okay? So that would be Rebbe Meir's opinion. So according to Rebbe Meir, we could learn that a, uh, that a compromise uh, does not need a kinyan because he says it needs three judges. And if it needed three judges, then it obviously doesn't need a kinyan because if it had a kinyan, it wouldn't need three judges. Yeah, got it? And then the Gemara tells us, but anyway, Rabbi Meir, we don't go like you anyway. And this is going to please Julia and possibly Howard, the lawyers around, because they, they're looking for clarity here. Vahilchata, where my pointer is, Vahilchata, the halacha is, you know, it's like when you open up the, the uh, envelope for, the, for the, uh, the Oscars, and the winner is, the halacha is, Pshara Tzricha Kinyan. The Pshara, a compromise, does require a Kinyan. And so therefore, you could say, it doesn't actually say this, but you could therefore imply that we don't go according to Rabbi Meir. Because if we went according to Rabbi Meir, we would not need that kinyan because we've got three judges. So the halacha appears to be that we require a kinyan, 
And by implication, the halacha is not like Rabbi Meir, according to the, uh, requiring three judges for compromise. Yes, David. Could, could I offer a simpler explanation, which doesn't come out from, from what we've read, that by calling Peshara Bitsua, Rabbi Meir is basically saying, I don't believe in compromise at all. Therefore, it's Dine Marmonos Bishlosha. Big deal. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a din which requires the three judges. Correct. You're 100% right. And if you remember, we actually said that last week. Um, when we first started this discussion about Bitsua, I'll come to you in a sec, Stanley. Um, when we, we first started this discussion about Bitsua, last week, uh, that's exactly what we said. We said the fact that Rabbi Meir calls this bitsua uh, is showing his disdain for the whole process of pshara because he thinks that it's a theft both ways. Uh, it's a theft, um, it's a theft uh, both ways for uh, um, the uh, litigants because neither of them are getting what they should get. Uh, and he's not keen on it at all, and that's why. He it, it, it in which work. case, in which case, why does the Gemara even raise what Rabbi Meir believed as re whether it required Kenyan or not? Because to him, there, there is no Peshara. Well, I don't think it's as cut and dried as that. I think that what Rabbi Meir is Gemara saying. Never is, yeah. Yeah, no, I think what Rabbi Meir is saying. Well, look, I, I can't trash Bitsua halachically, but I'm telling you good and proper, that I don't like Bitsua, I don't like Peshara, and I'm showing you my disdain for it by saying that we require three judges. And as far as I'm concerned, in my mind, I know that you don't accept this, everybody else, but I'm telling you, says Rabbi Meir, in my mind, <coughs> there's no difference between Bitsua and Peshara. If you're going to go down that compromise route, which I don't like, you're going to have to have three judges. Um, and he, that's why he uses the expression bitsua, and that is why um, he uh, that is why he um, says that you need three judges for it. Um, the fact that you need a kinyan, I think, is implying that we don't paskin like Rebbe Meir. Okay, now um, we've come to a, a little uh, uh, symbol here, which tells us that we can take a breath and uh, we are gonna go back to something that we discussed a bit earlier on. Now, so far we've had a couple of Bryce Brightot. Yes, oh, first of all, Stanley, I forgot to come back to you. Yes, Stanley, you wanted to ask something and then Julia. Uh, yeah, I wanna ask, uh, even if you have a Kenyan, is compromise, is somebody has to officiate this Kenyan? It's not like you go on a street and uh, you uh, get uh, two witnesses and just say, okay, okay, and it's go. Even at that time, they don't, I don't know if they have lawyers at that time and this, but somebody has to officiate, at least they need one judge. Okay, I so think. it doesn't need to be a judge. A Kenyan can be witnessed by any two kosher witnesses. So uh, anybody who is uh, fitting to be a witness now, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole uh, half a masechta on but who can be a witness and who can't be a witness. So, for example, um, do you have to do you have to come with some documents proving this Kenyan or not? No. What would happen is if you've got, let's say you're making a, a, a compromise. Let's say the situation is this: um, there's a dispute between uh, Ruven and Shimon. Ruven uh, uh, says that Shimon owes him a hundred pounds. And Shimon says, I don't owe him a hundred pounds. I don't owe him anything. Okay. And they sit down, the two of them, and they come to a compromise, either on their own or with the help of a judge. Uh, and they come to a compromise and they say, I can tell you what Shimon says, I'll give you 50 and we'll compromise. Okay, you can't prove that I owe you 100 and I can't prove I owe you, I owe you nothing. We'll come to a compromise. And they say, okay. Now, if they've got any sense, 
Reuben and Shimon, they'll write that down and they'll each have a copy of the document uh, and they'll each sign it uh, and then nobody can then come back and deny it happened. Okay, another way to do it would yes. be to have two witnesses to uh, witness the agreement. So Reuben would say to Shimon and Shimon would say to Reuben that they agree on this compromise and then they would make a Kinyan, which would be witnessed by two kosher witnesses, right? Those two kosher witnesses would then sign the document to say that they've witnessed the, uh, the whole process. Now, if there was no but document- it still, it still has to be documented. It still has to be documented. I'm just coming to that now. Let's say yeah. there was no document, or let's say the document got lost, right? The document no longer exists. And at a later date, Reuven comes to Shimon and says, you owe me 100 shekels. And Shimon says, no, I don't. I owed you 50. And I've given you the 50. And Shimon, Reuven says, yeah, I know you gave me the 50. I agree with that. But you owe me 100. And Shimon says, no, we made a compromise. And Reuven says, no, we didn't. Where's the document? And they can't find the document. Documents missing or for whatever reason. They then go and find, Shimon would then have to go and find his two witnesses, bring them along to court, and the witnesses would testify in a court of law that they witnessed the Kinyan of this compromise. Okay? Does that answer your question, Stanley? Okay, good. Julia? We can't hear you. Unmute. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think I must be very naive, but I was shocked with, about the um, point about the Kinyan uh, for uh, the wedding ceremony and to understand that the, um, the Qatan is making an acquisition, which is that the basis of all the problem with the Agu not? that there is an acquisition by the Khatan? No, uh, that's a slightly different issue. The Khatan makes an acquisition to confirm that he understands what he's, what he's getting into with this Ketubah. The Ketubah is a safeguard for the woman. Okay, in the Ketubah, it writes that the Khatan will do A, B and C, he'll look after her, he'll give her clothing, he'll give her food, etc., etc., And if he wants to divorce her, he will give her 100,000 shekels or whatever it's written in the Ketubah. And uh, the witnesses are there to confirm that the Khatan understands exactly what he has uh, agreed to. So that he can't come along afterwards and say, oh, I never knew it said that in the Ketubah. I'm not giving her 100,000 shekels. I'm going to divorce her and she can get lost. No, he can't do that because there are two witnesses who have signed to say, you, Mr. Khatan, understood because we heard you say, I understand everything that's in this ketubah. And a masader kidushin, the person who is conducting the wedding, has a responsibility and most people don't actually see this happen, only those that are sat around the tish will see this happen, that the uh, rabbi needs to explain to the Khatan exactly what is in the Ketubah, what he is uh, agreeing to, and to get his uh, formal acquisition by making a Kinyan that uh, he understands that, the, the, the content of the Ketubah, and that he agrees to abide by the content of the Ketubah. The two witnesses are there to confirm that he did that. But it's a difference, isn't it, between the word acquiesce or agreement and acquisition. Okay. Acquisition um, suggests a purchase. Yeah, no, no, no. What he's, what he's acquiring is the hanky. Right. right. By making an acquisition of something, by making an acquisition of something, then uh, he is 
formalizing the act. It doesn't matter what he acquires. It can be a hanky, can be his capital. What happens is the rabbi gives him a hanky, he acquires it, and then it's his. Usually he gives it back to the rabbi afterwards because he doesn't want it, right? But he doesn't have to. If he wants to keep that hanky, he can. It's his. He's acquired the hanky. And it's that acquisition that causes the... Uh, it causes him to signify the agreement to what he's doing. What happens? So it just, one sec, Johnny. It's just okay. the problem is uh, the two words acquisition and acquiesce in English sound the same, but have nothing to do with one another. Okay. So he's not acquiring the bride. No, he acquires the bride when he, when he puts the ring on her finger and says, Hare at Mekudeshet Lee. Right. Okay. What happens if one of the witnesses goes missing? Uh, well, as long as he's signed and he was a kosher witness at the time, uh, you're okay. If the witness has gone missing and you've lost the document, you're in trouble. That's why you shouldn't lose the document. That's why a ketubah should be kept very carefully. Okay. Yes, Howard? I suspect that this is at a time when there were no Jewish lawyers. Are rep legal representatives around to act for the parties. All this is to protect what we would call today litigants in person. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, there may well have been uh, unofficial uh, people who would be called a to'ain, somebody who would put your case uh, uh, uh -huh. forward for you, um, and you may or may not pay them to do that. But um, yes, th th these are all assuming litigants in person, correct? Uh, any litigant in person who's not familiar with things would no doubt, because that would be a clever thing to do, go and ask somebody who knows about these things to advise them, which is the basis of uh, engaging uh, a lawyer, isn't it? Really? Any other questions? Okay, I think we'll stop here actually, uh, because this is a good place to, to stop. And if we start here, we'll only get through a couple of words and it's, uh, it's almost quarter past. So uh, we'll stop here and carry on next week uh, at, uh, at Tanu Rabbanam. We're gonna learn next week yet another brighter about uh, judging with three judges and uh, Pshara. Um, we remember at the moment we, we're saying that Shara it cannot does not necessarily need three. Uh, if you just have a look at what our brighter is going to say, I'll just give you a taster. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbis taught, Kishem Sha'adin Bishlosha, just as judgment, halachic judgment is, it needs three, Kach Bitsua Bishlosha. So a uh, compromise needs three. So now we've now got a problem because what did Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel said it only needs two and the Chachamim said it only needs one. So what are they going to do with this brighter? Tune in next week to find out. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions before I stop recording? Okay. Recording 